what I want to do is to talk to you a little bit about uh, science in crisis and basically um, from my perspective as a psychologist with all these complicated words um, where uh, open comes in and I want to talk to you a little bit about open science as a reform movement. So now you know that I'm a psychologist um, and I know that many of you aren't um, and I think in this room we're all actually pretty different. I took a look at the, um, at the proposals uh, for the uh, fellowship this year and those are just uh, images representing some of them. So we have some philosophy going on, we have some things about cycling, um, there is uh, things about um, surgeons, about animals, about EEG. Um, there, there are a lot of different things um, going on here. Um, science indeed does just have many facets. But then um, this makes me wonder, even if we are so different, do we actually have anything in common? we, the people who do science. And I think that we do. Um, I think doing science means something like looking for the truth, for some version of the truth, for, for something. And we're looking for something where our insights lead us, for clearing the fog, although we do go about it in very different ways. So the way that we walk down the path towards whatever we're walking towards, um, the way we do this is very different, but what matters to us seems to be something like seeing clearly at the end of the path. So um, in science, we tend to have a mission which has something to do with finding, finding out something. But for a while now, there's been a bit of a tension between mission and practice. So um, I wanna point this uh, very kind of common experience to you. Have you ever tried to bake a cake? and you go online and you search for recipes, so here there's a cherry cake and it looks super pretty. And uh, then you try it yourself and it just looks vastly different. And I think this is something that we've got going on in science a lot at the moment. Uh, someone says, oh, I have done this thing and here is how pretty my results are. And then you try to do it as well and your results look dramatically different. So <laughs> this is a problem that in my discipline, we definitely have. Um, on the left, I brought an example for where someone said, I've done this thing and it's really cool. Um, this is about power posing. It's a, um, a TED talk that has millions of views. And the idea is that if you pose like this uh, for a short while, this can improve your self-esteem. Uh, it'll help you be more confident. It'll help you um, ask for more money in a nego negotiation, these kinds of things. Well, that sounds really cool. but like the cherry pie, it just doesn't work out like that if you try to do it again. Um, another study that uh, just became, uh, again, the center of news very recently um, is the one about facial feedback, um, where the way how you hold a pen, either this way or like uh, in a way that stimulates the smiling muscles, is supposed to alter your mood. So um, if, you, if you do like this, it's like smiling, it makes you feel happy. If you do like that, it's like frowning, it makes you feel sad. Um, the person who did this just got an Ig Nobel Prize um, for it, I think yesterday. And uh, not only for this finding, but also for the fact that it doesn't seem to be there after all. So there were some uh, attempts to rerun studies about this manipulation and it just doesn't work. So again, a cake that doesn't really work. Um, and there are tons of other examples from psychology. For instance, if I make you think about old age, you will walk more slowly. Or if I um, let you wash your hands, you will feel morally cleansed and you will feel um, like you haven't done anything wrong in a while. And those are just examples of findings of experimental studies um, that were published in the psychological literature, peer reviewed. And after a while, someone else decided, let's rerun this. Let's, let's try a uh, replication. Let's try to do this experiment again. And in, in fact, uh, we couldn't find evidence for it. So here we have a mismatch between mission and practice. Now, how big is this mismatch between mission and practice? What is the, the empirical estimate for uh, how many studies exist in the literature that can't be replicated? Studies that maybe someone pretended to find something or actually found something and it was just a fluke and we can't find it again. If we try to put it on a scale, we could have something like 0% all scientific literature is a sham. Or we could have 100% everything is always correct. Well, I think both zero and 100 are unlikely. 
because of the way that we run our sciences. Um, but we do have some actually empirical evidence, and this is what I have in pink here that I'd like you to focus on, um, from psychology, um, a study with 100 experimental projects uh, found that only 36 of them could be replicated. 30 36 of them, yes. So there's 36% of psychological studies that can be run again and show the same result. Um, in behavioral economics, that's the other number, the 66.7%, it's a bit more. So two thirds of the studies, of the experiments they run, uh, they say they can replicate. But then the purple number over there from cancer biology tells us that their replication rate, the rep rate at which you can rerun an experiment that has something to do with cancer biology and find the same result as the original study is somewhere between 11 and 25%. So that seems pretty shocking. Yeah, those are pretty, those are pretty terrible numbers. And they are far away from the 100% that we would hope for. Now, uh, what I want to do is I want to ask why. Why do we have this? Um, what is the reason um, that we have a literature that seems to include so many false positives, so many effects that aren't really there? And one of the big reasons is the system of publish or perish in which we exist as scientists. So mo in more detail, what does this mean? This means there are a number of things that you have to do if you want to go from being a scientist to being a super great scientist who gets tenure or who gets a book deal or who gets to be invited to give a talk or who gets to do other super cool and awesome things. And um, how do you get from just a scientist to super awesome scientist? Well, the thing you have to do is you have to publish as much as possible. Publishing as much as possible helps you um, also, it helps you to publish in journals with a high impact factor because people think um, that means that your work is particularly important. It helps you uh, to publish if you work in experimental um, work. It helps you publish uh, if you publish uh, work that is uh, includes significant results. And to get a, the super awesome scientist crown, um, it also helps you if you publish something that is surprising or catchy. Some, something that intuitively seems to make sense, but that so far no one saw coming. Now, um, why is that a problem? Because those incentives mean that you are not incentivized to publish the truth. You're incentivized to get something out there um, that helps you get a job, uh, money, research funding, and so on, um, but not necessarily to do the best science that you could. So that means you can game the system. You, if you work experimentally or empirically, you want to run as many so small studies as possible and uh, that way just use your money and your time um, efficiently to uh, also inflate the false discovery rate because the more small studies you run, the more likely it is that at some point you will stumble over some kind of a significant finding and that's easy to publish, we already know that. So it actually makes sense for you to run studies that are stacked against the truth. It also helps you if you are a little bit flexible in the way that you analyze your data, for instance, by um, stopping data collection when you've just reached a point at which uh, your uh, results are significant, because that's what you want, right? You want that significant result. And it also helps you if you are um, doing your analysis in a bit of a creative way. Perhaps you can exclude a subject here and there, and that means that you get your um, significant result. Flexibility um, and reported results can also help you because, well, maybe you ran three different conditions in your experiment, but only two of them really work out the way you thought, so you just leave out the third one. Who needs to talk about it? So I could give you a talk about how to game the system. I could tell you how to become a master cheater. Um, part of this is also hiding your data because if you hide your data, no one can check what you did. And if you hide your materials also, no one can even know what kind of a study or what kind of a um, scientific discovery you, discovery you set out to do in the first place. Um, and also, you should of course never try to run your experiment or your study again, because you might find something that's different. So these are all the things that you should do um, if you wanna game the system. But of course, it's clear all of these have nothing to do with finding something real. All of these have nothing to do with finding something about the truth. So that means basically, this has nothing to do with science. And this is 
where open science comes in. Open science helps researchers focus on the thing that they actually want to do, find out something about the world. And in that uh, regard, open science is basically a reform movement trying to shift around the system so that you don't have to game, game it anymore. What does this mean? And what I want to do now is I want to just briefly walk you through a bunch of different facets of what open science can do. Um, part of open science is working with uh, reliable and robust research. And one big important part, at least for people who work um, with empirical data, is that you pre-register what you want to do. The idea of a pre-registration is that before you start a project or before you gather data for a project, you announce to the world and say, here, this is the thing I want to do. You don't have to do that publicly um, because you, are, you might be uh, scared that you get scooped, someone else sees your idea. But you can put your idea in a system and say, later, once you've got your data, once you've done your analysis, when you're trying to publish your, your paper, you can prove to us that indeed the things that you're testing and reporting are the things that you wanted to test and report all along. So that helps us um, put, uh, put trust back into science. At least that's what some people argue. Others argue that pre-registration would put science in chains uh, because where is all the exploration of our data? We can no longer um, interpret data the way we want. And to um, sort of take, take out that uh, argument, I want to show you some data because I like data. And the data I want to show you is this. Um, the data here is from randomized control studies um, that deal with cardiovascular uh, diseases, events or even deaths that's related to things like heart attacks. And uh, these randomized control studies um, try, to try to come up with some kind of a medication that helps people against problems with their heart. And that's a good thing, right? So um, what we have is um, data from studies ran between 1970 and 2012. And those were all really big projects um, that had very, very high costs. And the idea here is that um, if it's a really big project with a high cost, this is kind of a quality um, check for us. Yeah? So we just take this as a proxy for a good quality study. Now, if we look at some of the old studies, um, we can see that most of them report for the drug that they're testing some kind of a benefit. Benefits are the little pluses. Or at, at most, maybe a neutral, there is no real effect on the thing that they try to study. So that's the, uh, the blue dots. And 2000, this is when it became mandatory to pre-register clinical trials on a website called uh, clinicaltrials.gov. And following this point, you can see just by eyeballing how drastically the data changed. So suddenly we see lots more of more drugs that don't have any effect at all, a bunch that do work, and even one that's harmful if you do take it for the thing that it's trying to cure, for the cardiovascular disease. So my question to you is, which drug would you rather take? One of these or one of those? And I think that's the best argument in favor of pre-registration. Um, yeah. But um, pre-registration doesn't magically solve all of our problems um, because even if data is, da uh, even if hypotheses are pre-registered, -pre um, there's some evidence that uh, people still try to game the system. So here is um, data from the website Compare Trials. And um, what these people did is to compare um, randomized control studies that were run in the year 2015 and 16 and published in, top five in the top five medical journals. So it's like The Lancet and so on. And 67 trials were checked. Out of these nine were perfect. And 354, so that means the other trials were not perfect, and in the non-perfect trials, 354 outcomes that were originally registered, even in this pre it was mandatory to register. These outcomes were not registered and they were not reported. And additional outcomes were added in their stead. So even if we have things like pre-registration, um, it doesn't necessarily mean that uh, our, um, that solves our problems about uh, gaming the, the system. So this is what we would call open washing. People pretend uh, like they've done um, everything they s were supposed to, like they are being honest about their data, but if you look more closely, they really aren't. The good thing is, though, we can tell. But if that's not good enough, what else can we do? Well, we can try to replicate studies. 
for instance, these randomized controlled control trials. We can try uh, to run them again um, and see how they turn out. There are two different approaches to this. Um, either you do a broad approach and you try to replicate many um, studies from the field, this is what I showed you before, uh, where we get the estimates of, for instance, the replicability in psychology, or you can try to focus on one area and go deep into that area and um, replicate um, projects in this one um, in this one field. I'm not going to go into the details here because I simply don't have time, but there are so many cool projects that are going on at the moment. For instance, um, um, the study swap project is uh, an idea where it's that's just really terribly low level, where you can go on a website and say, hey, I ran the study. Does anyone want to replicate it? And someone else can go, sure, I'll run it. And I have five minutes in my next experiment left over. I can just replicate your study. So there are many really, really super cool projects going on at the moment. Another aspect to uh, reliable and robust research is sharing your resources. And if you share your data and uh, replicate other people's work, you can help facilitate meta-analysis. For instance, on this website, uh, Curate Science, where you can upload your data and it automatically adds it to um, a calculation of a meta-analysis about a specific effect. So um, this is a digital hub for, um, for running meta-analysis together with others. Sharing resources can also mean sharing your participants. For instance, if you've ever done any research with babies, you know that it's really hard to get babies into the lab. Um, so there's um, the Many Babies Project, where uh, labs around the world share the access they have to um, parents who are willing to bring their baby uh, to the lab, and then you can ask them to run a small part of your research uh, with these babies internationally. The idea of uh, sharing resources and also sharing brain power is not at all uh, limited to um, fields like psychology. So for instance, this is um, a map of the ATLAS co collaboration um, that works on testing the standard model in physics. And they have more than 3,000 authors working together from 183 institutions on trying to test if the standard model is the same. Um, the Human Genome Project is another really cool um, example of how sharing brain power can help you um, achieve knowledge that just one lab or one research group really couldn't achieve. And this, is a, this was a 13-year joint effort to sequence the human genome. And the data actually now is publicly available. Open also means making your material and methods transparent. This means documenting what exactly you've done. This also can mean that you can rely on uh, software that helps other people do the exact same thing that you have done without having to pay lots of money in terms of fees for proprietary f software. But if I can just download the software from the internet and run it on my computer, I can do see exactly what you've done and try to build on your work. And uh, this then is another instance of open science. But it's not only about software, it's also about hardware. It's also about helping people produce the means they need to do their science um, in the lab that they work on themselves. So uh, for instance, um, you could 3D print uh, some kind of a piece of equipment that you need and therefore cut costs and make it possible for others to be able to reproduce and uh, replicate your work because they can also just 3D print this exact piece of technology. Open work in science also means open publishing and opening the way that we publish. Um, and this is not just about data, but um, and not just about meta-analysis, as I talked about before, but it's also about the finished project, um, the, the paper that you write down. Can you pu um, publish it open access? Can you publish a preprint of your paper? Uh, can you publish a postprint of your paper? And therefore make it available to others so that uh, they, can, they can see it, they can engage with it, they can check your work. Opening peer review is another part of open science where people ask, well, maybe the people who check my work uh, before it gets published, um, it would be nice to engage with them openly about the way that they check this work. Um, so there are many opportunities in which um, open science has, op has opened and is opening up the way that we publish our work. And of course, open also means that we need to somehow change the way that we think about teaching others how to do science. 
So if, as a community, we embrace the idea of doing open science, that also means we need to teach students how open science is done. Meaning that there's a whole new field in which teaching is needed, open science knowledge. Um, it also means that we can embrace the principles of open science for teaching. And that means we can do things like open educational resources and make teaching and learning resources available um, under uh, an open license so that um, we can allow people to access them freely. And also adapt them, and this is in particular something in uh, psychology we need to do at the moment because all the old textbooks still include all the old findings that don't hold up. Uh, this is what I also worked on last year. Um, so I, I worked on in my fellowship um, an open online course about how to do experimental research while also using open science principles. But there are many others who work on um, open science knowledge as an open educational resource. And I just want to plug a couple of these so perhaps there's something that uh, you can learn about them. Um, learning about statistics in a different way and in, in a deeper way is a big, big thing for many of us. And there's this really cool resource by Daniel Larkins um, who, who, who tells you how to make better statistical inferences. And then there is this other really cool thing called How to Open Science um, by another person who is also here <laughs> and part um, of this fellowship. Um, and I guess we should definitely, can you wave? <laughs> you should talk to Felix and after, after all this over a beer about how to open science. Open science also starts to affect policy and uh, science policy in particular because open science starts to seep in to what funders think is important, um, to how we communicate about science to the world with the citizens, with the people about whom the science is. And it also has to do something with democratization because if things are available openly, that means we can access them without or with lower barriers of access and that means access in any kind of way. It means access in terms of where you are, how much money you have, what kind of um, social role you play. And um, in that sense, open science is a big way to open doors. So um, all in all, open science can basically build a solid basis for insight and open science can hel help us build a good fundament for, for making good insight and do the thing that we care about, do the thing that we want to do as scientists, create insights. So basically, um, I'm preaching to the choir because you are all really motivated to do something about open science. But please do, because open science means changing the game. And I think the game really needs changing because we are trying to do something cool. We are trying to tr create insight. And we can only do this if we can actually focus on the thing we want to do, creating insight. And with that, um, I'd like to quickly add two words of thanks. First one to my um, PhD advisor, who is not here, but who's the person who got me started on open science. And then also to uh, Johanna for um, helping me do more open science here. And in fact, uh, we wrote a, a small introduction that is very much like this talk together. If you want to read more examples and show your friends why they should do open science, um, you can read our preprint um, there. So. Thank you so much for listening and for having me be here. I'm so glad that I got to talk to you about open science and about all the different facets. This was a really broad approach, um, but I hope that it was interesting for you. And if you have any questions at all, I'm happy to take them. Ja, vielen, vielen Dank, Rima, für deine Keynote. Und äh, wir haben jetzt, wie Rima das gerade schon gesagt hat, noch ein paar Minuten für Fragen oder Anmerkungen von euch. Also wenn jemand was sagen, fragen möchte, dann gebt uns einfach ein Zeichen. Dann äh, ja, ist jetzt der Raum. Ansonsten könnt ihr natürlich später auch mit Rima noch sprechen. Ähm, ja, bitte. Äh, hallo, äh, I'm uh, German or English? Ist egal, ich kann beides. Okay. Ähm, ja, hallo Lisa, äh, äh, neue Fellow. Ähm, du hattest gerade gemeint, es war eher ein Broad Approach. Ich fand eigentlich, weil du hast ja sehr über harte Wissenschaften gesprochen, eigentlich 
dann in dem Sinn eher narrow, wenn wir mal die Wissenschaft als zweites äh, betrachten. Ähm, und ich hat, fand, ähm, du hast immer von Scam und Gaming the System gesprochen, gleichzeitig aber ja auch schöne Beispiele gezeigt, wie WissenschaftlerInnen ganz offen ähm, ihre Arbeit zur Verfügung stellen und sagen, bitte repliziert. Also das war für mich so ein kleiner Widerspruch, weil das zuerst so negativ war, als wäre die Replication Crisis quasi, weil alle WissenschaftlerInnen irgendwie korrupt sind und sich äh, dem System beugen. Siehst du auch irgendwie die Möglichkeit, vielleicht mehr über den Prozess, wie wissenschaftliches Wissen hergestellt wird, herauszufinden? Also man guckt, wie entstehen denn eigentlich diese Diskrepanz, dass, Re dass Replikationen nicht möglich sind, ähm, ohne halt zu sagen, okay, die haben alle geschummelt, die haben alle gelogen. Also vielleicht gibt es da ja auch andere Bedingungen, die spannend wären, äh, die zu identifizieren, um halt diese Probleme zu lösen. Ja, Dankeschön. Danke für deinen Kommentar. Ähm, ich würde dir total zustimmen, indem ich ähm, definitiv nicht sagen wollen würde, dass Wissenschaftler irgendwie Betrüger sind. Also gibt es sicher auch, aber der durchschnittliche Wissenschaftler ist sicher kein Betrüger. Und ähm, ich glaube, dass es eher daran liegt, wenn, wenn wir als Wissenschaftler nicht, nicht auf die Wahrheit gerichtet arbeiten, ähm, dann liegt es nicht daran, dass wir betrügen wollen, sondern ich glaube, das liegt daran, ähm, wie wir unsere unsere Umwelt wahrnehmen und äh, wie wir reagieren auf die Incentives, auf die Anreize, ähm, die in dieser Umwelt ähm, sind. Wie, sorry, Deutsch, Englisch, schwierig. <lacht> ähm, die in dieser Umwelt sind. Und ähm, deswegen würde ich nicht, also ich, ich würde an der Stelle eher ähm, die Situationsvariable als die wichtigere und die kritische ansehen und an der wir, denke ich, was rütteln müssen und auch was rütteln können, nämlich über Open Science. Um, und ich denke, ich denke nicht, dass es sozusagen an, an uns als Wissenschaftlern liegt, dass wir es irgendwas falsch machen wollen. Um, ich glaube, wir können das besser. Das, uh, und ich glaube, das können wir auch, egal wie hart oder weich die Wissenschaft ist. Weitere Fragen, Anmerkungen? Dann, Sima, nochmal vielen, vielen Dank. Ich danke euch. Oh. Ach so. Ich bin Eva, ich bin auch ein neuer, sagt man eigentlich Fellowin, also Fellow. Ähm, ähm, eine Sache, die vielleicht noch fehlte, war, ähm, fand ich, äh, Langzeitarchivierung, also ähm, Sustainability von Daten, die man eben einerseits in, in, äh, in Terms of <lacht> Hardware, ähm, äh, also langfristig auch bereitstellen muss, aber eben auch, ähm, die dann auch erklären muss, semantisch aufbereiten muss und so weiter. Das ist, glaube ich, noch ein, noch ein Punkt, der noch nicht auftauchte, aber möglicherweise noch wichtig ist eigentlich. Ja, ja, total. Also die, die Daten, von denen ich euch aufrufe, sie zu teilen, dann wieder verwendbar zu machen, ist, glaube ich, auch eine ganz große Herausforderung für uns. Denn nicht nur sie sozusagen an einer Stelle zu haben, wo sie wirklich immer sicher sind, sondern auch auf eine Art und Weise dort aufzuheben, sodass jemand anders sie wieder benutzen kann und dass der wieder versteht, was du eigentlich meintest damit, ähm, sie halbwegs sinnvoll auch findet und so weiter. Ich glaube, das sind alles super spannende und mega wichtige Aufgaben, die, finde ich, auch gehören zu, wir müssen einfach ein Umfeld schaffen, ähm, in dem wir besser arbeiten können. Aber total richtig, danke dir. Okay, dann, wie gesagt, danke dir nochmal und äh, du bist ja auch noch ein bisschen hier, glaube ich, und dann könnt ihr natürlich euch gerne weiter im Klima austauschen. Applaus